All right, my Americans. New year, new rig, new me. That's not true. Same sarcastic, whiny, smug me. New everything else. You have got to get your heart right with the Lord before you ship an RV. Because this is a lot of money that you put in a complete stranger's hands and just hope that it gets to where it's going. Now, I deal with a lot of car shipping with real estate clients, buyers and sellers, because they're moving and they've always got a bunch of cars. And so I usually deal with the car side of this. There's some overlap, but there's also some ways that they're very different. And it goes one of two ways. Typically, I'd say nine times out of 10, it's uneventful. They deliver the car, you sign for it, you're done. And then sometimes it's a complete shit show. And usually that shit show involves they bought on price, so they got the lowest carrier possible, and then they got what they pay for. And I've had carriers hold cars hostage where they bring it to your city here in Wilmington and then they will not give it to you until you give them more money. Or they we just lose communication with them and they disappear for like days on end. I don't know if they're taking it on a joy ride, I'm not sure. So you cut this, you very much get what you pay for on this, but there are some tips and tricks that I've learned along the way, both for cars and RVs that will save you a whole lot of hassle. You're still gonna need to pray about it and take some Xanax about it, but I will save you some hassle. I ended up finding this in Arizona. And so all of my friends were like, oh, well, just fly out there and like make an adventure of it. No, I have driven cross country by myself twice. And it's really exciting at the beginning and really exciting for the last like 40 miles and sucks the whole time in between, mainly because of Oklahoma. Oklahoma. It's so long, it takes forever, and there's like not much to look at. The two times I've driven through the length of Oklahoma, I have considered getting into an accident just so I could have someone to talk to. It's January, like it's not gonna be fun. And if I'm gone, you know, if you drive like, I don't know, eight to 10 hours a day, it's still gonna take you five or six days. So that's a lot of time that I'm out of work. And if I'm not selling houses, I'm not making any money. So I kind of had to be here for it. I started to look for a shipper. Now car shippers and RV shippers, again, they're a little bit the same, but there are some differences. So the main thing you need to understand is like the structure of that business model. There's carriers and then there's brokers. Let's start with brokers. Brokers, broker, real estate broker, but it's for autos. There are no brokers, there's no companies that own a bunch of cars and manage a whole crew of guys and that they run the whole operation themselves. That's just not how the model works. So you have brokers. Brokers bid out your request. Uh, so like there's some websites that I put on. I have a Thor 18M, this is its height, this is its weight, this is when I'm estimating pickup, this is when I'd like it delivered. And then those brokers take that and they bid it out to carriers. Now carriers tend to be very small operations. They actually own the trucks and they run the crews. And that can be anything from a couple people to like a guy, just a guy. Those are carriers. The model is set up this way, very similar to why we have brokers in real estate, is because when you actually take the amount of money made, if the carrier also had to be in charge of marketing and advertising and doing quotes and essentially like running the business, there's really no money in it for them. They're good at what they do, which is put a guy in a truck or a car or an 18 wheeler, whatever it is, and just let him do the drive. So the broker manages the business and the carriers actually do the work. So that's important to understand is you're not gonna find a company who does it all. But when you understand this relationship, you can kind of see who you wanna work with because you can work with carriers directly. I chose not to do that. All right, so when, when you're shipping an RV, you wanna make sure that they have experience shipping an RV. Uh, especially if it's a travel trailer, because if they're just going to put the pin in on your fifth wheel and drag it, well, you have to know how to drive that. To some degree, there's some flexibility in between all makes and models, but like, you know, fifth wheel in particular, like that's a lot of woman. <laughs> it's a lot of woman. So you have to make sure that they have experience doing it. Do you also want to make sure whether you talk to the carrier or the broker that whoever's driving it, that they are insured that their insurance is going to be primary, that they have a DOT number, and that they're licensed and bonded. So 
you there's just like some homework that has to be done on the front end i found that that was harder to do trying to talk to the carrier directly because he was driving it was easier to talk to the broker you can go on sites like shipley and uship.com i would do that for a car like a car I didn't really care about. I'd not do it for Bob because I love Bob and he's special. And Bob, I would put on an airplane and fly to me versus have some stranger drive him. But the thing with you ship and Shipley are like, those are guys and some carriers, but a lot of guys, like just a guy. And there are people who sort of as like a, a gig, a side gig or their main gig, they bid on the quote you put in and you get, you put in what you want and you're gonna get like 20 quotes and your phone is gonna ring all night long because they're all competing for business and your email inbox is gonna blow up. But a lot of it is is a guy. And that was what I had a problem with because you have to have experience driving RVs. Again, particularly towing, but like this is, I mean, this is a class B and this is a very tiny class B, but it's different. It's a different driving experience. So you can do that, and I got quotes anywhere from $900 to $6,000. Well, I knew that $6,000, that was pretty high. But $900 sounded like they were going to drive it to Mexico and sell it for parts. So we're not doing that. Please do not get fooled by those low bids. They all know that they're bidding. So there's a subset of them that will bid super duper low. And I just, when I've seen people do it with cars, it never works out. It's just, it's too little money. There's gonna, they're gonna get their money somehow. No, I just, that I knew was way too low. The bigger issue and why I ultimately decided not to use those websites is because of insurance. So let's say something happens on the road. The person who's gonna call me is gonna be the guy. We'll call him Tyler to make it easy. So Tyler gets into an accident. Maybe Tyler hit someone or someone hit, it doesn't matter. If I call my insurance and say, hey, that you know new rig that I bought that you're insuring, uh, it's been in an accident. Okay, well, where? Uh, middle of Oklahoma. And uh, Tyler is driving it. I went back to the broker model. And then I had to decide, do I want a carrier who's going to drive it or do I want to put it on a flatbed? You are going to pay more for a flatbed. I ended up choosing this means of transport. When you hire a carrier and they're going to drive it, you know, just know, and I actually didn't have a problem with this at all, but they're going to sleep in your rig. They're, they, of course they are. They're going to tell you on their quote that they, that part of their pricing is for hotels and Ubers to get them to the hotel and all that stuff. And like, they're going to sleep in it. Absolutely. So just know that. And I would just be clear up front and say, look, I know you're going to sleep in the rig <laughs> because you are. Please do not use the toilet. You do not want to be cleaning out someone else's waste. Most of them are not going to do that, but I think it's worth saying. I would just acknowledge up front that you understand the deal because that is the deal. They want to save money on hotels. They're going to sleep in your rig. They're not going to lick your pillow. Probably not, but like just acknowledge it up front. For my situation, the Lamborghini was in Arizona, which means if somebody drove it, it's going to arrive to me with 3,000 plus more miles on it and probably needing an oil change. Well, I don't really want that. So I ended up paying more to have a flatbed drive it. And so that way I don't have the damage on the miles and or the systems and fluids and all that. It really wasn't that much more expensive. It was... 30 actually I think it was more expensive to have someone drive it yeah and that makes sense so it was about 3500 to have someone drive it and then it was 33 or 3400 to have it on a flatbed the reason that it's a little bit lower with this system is because they're deferring their total driving costs amongst multiple cars okay so on the truck that delivered the Lamborghini there were like five or six other cars. So we're all paying into that fuel pool and it kind of breaks it up. Uh, it's just, I, I think I would have been okay with the one guy, but ultimately this was the way better deal. Now, how did I find the one guy when I finally got down to those two methods? Well, I just asked the dealership. All the dealerships work with carriers and they are a great resource to tell you who they trust and who to avoid. So they had a guy that does a lot of work with them and I would have gone with him, except I just didn't want all the miles on the rig because it's party. Part of that 
contract is they're going to offer you gap insurance or AFTA, an AFTA policy. The way that this works is that, so when you get into a wreck and let's say that it's like a total loss, the insurance company is going to reimburse you pretty much like the market value of that rig. Well, the problem is, is if you bought a brand new rig, the second that they take it off the lot, it has lost value. So the gap insurance is to cover that gap. <laughs> See what they did there? So clever. So very clever. So basically, it's really valuable if you have a brand new vehicle and they take it off the lot. Now there's that gap there. The gap insurance will provide a buffer. I didn't. I did not get gap insurance for a few reasons. I might have gotten it if it was a guy driving it, but it's going to be on this giant 18 wheeler flatbed. And so if somebody hits the, <laughs> somebody hits that, like we, we're probably going to win. We might win that accident, but it was going to be up high. And I mean, someone would have to drive up on the flatbed and get into a fight with Rambo and Rambo would win. So I wasn't that worried about it. Furthermore, I got a great deal on the price based on what other rigs of same year, size, model, all that were selling for. So I didn't think that there was like too much of a discrepancy there. But a lot of the brokers or the carriers will include it automatically. So you have to read the contract if you don't want it. And it's not that expensive. It's like 75 bucks. But if you don't want it, you got to tell them so that you can get reimbursed for that. So the way that this goes is you get your rig under contract, you're moving forward with the many, 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 many pieces of paper that you have to sign, and then you have to negotiate and handle all this with uh, the broker or the carrier. Know that timing is going to affect your pricing. So for instance, in Arizona, come January, February, they do car shows there. And so the cost of transport going any which way is so much more because the demand is so much higher because there's all these car shows in Arizona going on. So just keep that in mind as you're planning when to do this. I was very diligent that like the second that I made the payment that I booked the carrier because I knew that about Arizona and I didn't want to pay more for anything. So let's talk about sort of how it goes uh, from start to finish. So when you identify your uh, carrier, uh, usually the broker then puts you directly in charge of managing that carrier. So they don't really say that, but like if you have any details to fill in with them, you need to fill it in with the carrier directly. Technically the broker is supposed to do it, but I'll say that once they kind of seal the deal, like it's up to you. So they will put you directly in touch with the carrier. That is going to be a guy who is driving your rig, whether with a lot of other cars or just your rig. This is not racist and it's not derogatory. It's just a fact from experience of doing this with cars and RVs. Often that person may not speak any English. And I don't mean like broken English. I mean, zero habla inglés, none. Make sure if that's going to be a problem for you that you tell the broker up front that your driver has to speak English. It's very common. I've not had any issues with it, but I'll tell you, it can be really startling. The people who bought the war wagon, they had it delivered through a carrier to Seattle. When they came to pick it up, I was trying to explain to them that they needed to check the air pressure in the tire first because it had been sitting for a while. We couldn't do it. I was miming, like circle, drive, <laughs> nothing. So they took off and hadn't checked the tire pressure. It made it because it was the war wagon, but like, just know that it's a thing. So if it bothers you, if you think you're gonna have trouble with it, then ask for somebody who speaks English. So let's now talk about how that day actually goes because the beauty of this is that you're really not involved, but you do have to organize it. You have to put the carrier, once the broker gives you the carrier's information, you have to put the carrier in touch with the delivery team at the dealership or the private seller who you are going to be using. Not your salesperson. You have to talk to the delivery people. They have what's called porters and the porters organize this and it's a well-oiled machine if you do it right. If you're doing this with a seller, the seller has got to understand that they have to be there, the rig has to be ready because time is money to a carrier. So that is a little bit trickier. I have done it. If you work with a good seller, then it's no issue. If you work with someone who doesn't have a clue and thinks that they can just like leave it in the driveway and someone will come get it, leave it like a key on a tire, that's not gonna happen. So you put those people all in touch with each other. The carrier will show up, they work with the porter and then they have to 
uh, transmit, transport, exchange, a document between the two of them and everything hinges on this document. It's called a bill of lading, a B-O-L, and you will be S-O-L without a B-O-L. <laughs> I'm just so clever. A bill of lading is a legal document between the carrier and you and the dealership. It sort of umbrellas everybody and it is absolutely critical. It's critical to you. It's critical to your insurance company. It's critical to the dealership, any police officers that they may meet along the way if there's a ticket, and to way stations. It basically identifies the vehicle fully. So it has their rap sheet. What's the VIN number? What's the make? What's the model? What's the color? What's everything that identifies that vehicle? Importantly, if not more importantly, it's a discussion between the two at the point of pickup about what kind of damage is there. I have to say, BNA Transportation, the carrier that delivered uh, the Lamborghini, they went with like a microscope and they got every single blessed little mark on this thing. I mean, I had to say to him at a certain point, I was like, man, like I would have never even asked about these because it's normal wear and tear. He said, oh, no, 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 no. Like some people, like they think a used rig should look brand new. Like we get everything. So the dealership, the porter and the carrier are going to go through and inspect all the damage and they note it on the bill of lading. When it's delivered to you, you should get a copy of the bill of lading and they should also present it to you. And then you go and check, okay, all this damage has been noted. And if there's new damage, then that's where the bill of lading really takes effect because that is, you know, here's how it was when it was picked up and here's how it is now. And that document, if you don't have that document, you're SOL, SOL. All right, well, how long does it take? So, so they pick it up and I'll tell you, nobody really talks to you during this period because they're very busy. And then, you know, they start transport. How long does it take? Well, that depends on where your rig or car is on that giant flatbed. If you're all the way up the front, well, they've got to deliver all these first. Luckily, Rambo was on the back. Um, and just the general track that they're going. They don't just drive yours and then drive home. They organize all these other pickups and drop-offs, so you may not be first. So it can take cross country. Uh, they picked up, they picked up the Lamborghini on Monday and they delivered it on Wednesday. So they drove hard, 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 hard to get across the country that fast. But I was the last vehicle on the back of the rig. So they couldn't deliver all these others until they dropped off the Lamborghini. So I came first. Other carriers, I've seen them as long as a week, a week and a half. And that can feel a little suspicious because you don't want someone to go on a joyride. But uh, it's just, it's the nature of where they're headed. And usually it takes longer if it's a flatbed and they've got other deliveries to make. You also want to make sure you check the mileage. What was the mileage on the contract? And then what was the mileage when it was delivered? I wasn't worried about that because I was on a flatbed. But if you have some guy, if Tyler, Trevor, whatever the hell his name is, if he's doing it, well, look at the mileage. And is that a reasonable amount of mileage? Or did they take it on a road trip? I, some people offered to drive my rig, like friends were like, oh, well, just fly me out there and I'll drive it back. I've always wanted to drive across the country. I, absolutely not. If you want to keep friends, do not mix this much, this much money between you and your friends. If something goes wrong, if they get into an accident, if someone hits them, I can promise your friendship is going to be frayed. It's just not worth it. It's a lot of money to ship a rig, but it's also a lot of peace of mind. And then you don't have to do anything. And that, that has a lot of value, a lot of value. What happens during delivery? So just know, and this is sort of a carrier thing, at least it's happened in everyone that I've been involved with, that they tend to show up at Jesus O30 in the morning, like way early in the morning. Time is money to them. They don't get paid till they deliver all these vehicles. So they want to get going right away. Well, I don't get up that early. <laughs> I don't. I did for the Lamborghini. I think we made that delivery at like 6.50, which I... Only farmers are up that early, not me. So they're gonna they're gonna either give you a heads up or they're not. And chances are you're just not gonna get a heads up. What you're gonna get is a phone call either very late at night or very early in the morning that they have just arrived. And this is particularly true if your driver doesn't speak any English because they, they can't give you a heads up. Luckily, my driver, I knew that he was getting in very late on Tuesday night but we decided that it would be best to do it the next morning. 
try as hard as you can to do this during the daylight. I definitely pushed it at dawn, but you have to go around and inspect the entire rig because that's the deal with the bill of lading. You can't see the damage in the pitch black. Also know that, and this didn't happen with this one, but it has happened in others. You're probably going to get pressured to do this quickly. So take your time because the moment that you accept that bill of lading and payment is made, that's it. After that, you can't make any claims. So take your time. They should be walking around and taking photos of the rig and you should be walking around and taking photos of the rig. Take videos, close-ups, wide shots, everything. Like you have to have this documented. Typically they only accept, they try to get you to bring cash. I brought a cashier's check or a bank check and there's no reason why they shouldn't accept that. If you have someone who will not accept a cashier's check, I would not hire that driver. There was no way on Beyonce's green earth that I was going to show up with $3,000 in my pocket in a dark parking lot for some man that I didn't know. That's not going to happen. A cashier's check is checked against your bank account. So it automatically comes out of your bank account. So it's guaranteed to clear. So there's no reason why they shouldn't accept that. They just like cash because, because the IRS, that's why, that's why. What happens if there's damage? If there's damage, you have to immediately call the broker. And this is another reason why I just like the broker model. I'm totally okay to pay more to have a broker as an intermediary and not just me and Kyle having a fight in the parking lot. I mean, I would win, but we'd still have to have that fight. If you see damage and it is not on the bill of lading, if it was in a wreck, anything like that, you have to call the carrier first. If you give them payment and you will probably be pressured to do so, but if you give them payment, like that's, that's it, you're done. You have no claim anymore because by accepting the bill of lading and giving cash, you are basically signing off on that agreement. It's no different than when we close a home. You had an option to do an inspection, you had a contract, and then you went to closing, you signed the contract, you agreed to it, everyone exchanged money, you can't come back an hour or a day or a week later, or in some cases a year, which is really funny to watch, and say like, this isn't what you said, or this was damaged, it's done, transaction is over. So if there's an issue, you call the broker immediately, you do not give them payment. You need to hold that payment over somebody's head because they have just done all that work and they want to get paid. So you have to give them motivation to actually resolve this issue. Typically what happens is they have everybody document it, they send it in, and then you do end up eventually giving payment and then it goes through insurance. Often, very often, the broker or carrier will try to negotiate in some kind of settlement or payment outside of insurance because nobody wants to deal with insurance. It raises rates, it's not good for their overall rating, and it's a pain in the ass. So typically, they'll try to work it out with you outside of that. But I cannot say this enough. If the rig is damaged and it's not in the bill of lading, do not give payment. Like, you have to stop the process right there. There you go, weirdos. You're now a little bit smarter than you were a couple minutes ago, actually a lot of minutes ago, but I didn't want to shortchange on anything. I used Amerifreight. Amerifreight put me in touch with BNA Transport. I had a great experience. I would use them again in a heartbeat. And I would certainly thank someone who did some of the dirty work for me to learn all this stuff, because if you don't know, you don't know. And in this case, you absolutely get what you pay for.